It often gets asked how people of conscience are able to commit acts like killing, imprisoning, and even worse against others and still go home and sleep well at night. It's a big question and beyond the scope of this video, maybe even this channel, but I have a short answer. Enemies. We have enemies. They pose a threat to something, and the authorities are doing what's necessary to stop them. When we're brought up to have enemies, when we accept the enemies our rulers construct for us, we're capable of any kind of cruelty. I'm not saying you shouldn't have enemies. I'm saying, unless you learn to question things, how could you know who your enemies are? I'm Chris, and welcome back to the channel some have described as On YouTube. This video is part, I don't know, 12 of a series trying to answer the question, what is a country? Here's a one-sentence answer if you don't want to start at the beginning. The country or state is created by a local ruling class as a kind of castle to protect their property. Over time, they create the nation by cultivating a sense of inside and outside. The feeling that things are different, and probably much worse, on the other side of the lines on the map. The nation becomes an in-group, and an in-group so strong, some people, okay, me, have likened it to a cult. Not only do in-groups have to have out-groups, in-groups define themselves by their out-groups. In its telling of history, the U.S. talks about how tyrannical colonial Britain was to contrast with the rhetoric of freedom the founders used. So now the rhetoric of freedom is integral to the self-image of the United States. It fights to liberate people from tyranny, invading and occupying half the world for liberty. There's a range of types of outgroups, from allies to deadly enemies, as you can see from this super scientific diagram I made. Still more rigorous than half of what makes it into political science journals. We artificially divide people to determine how much sympathy we should give them when they die. When I tell people children are being slaughtered and they want to know which children before moving into outrage mode or justification mode, that mentality, that conditional humanity, is exactly the problem. Not only are we given enemies, we're given friends, too. Just like parents set up playdates for their two-year-olds, states tell us who our friends and allies are in the world. But any group is always just one propaganda campaign away from being transferred to a different point on the spectrum, as these rigorously researched documentaries attest. Arbitrary divisions among people like nation and race are part of wielding power over them, divide and rule. We're indoctrinated to think these differences matter. The in-group is made up of individuals you want to protect with your life. The out-group is a faceless mass that we don't know and we don't want to know. Enemies break us off from other people and establish a hierarchy of who's more worthy of respect, freedom, and life. Enemies make it easier to treat anyone not included in the imagined community like dirt which among other functions, as I explained like three videos ago, keeps down the wages of migrant workers. Enemies justify any policy. If we didn't take away everyone's freedom, the bad people would steal your children. As a result, any job with any social value can be twisted to reinforce hierarchy and division. You want to be a journalist? Seems noble. We've always been told the purpose of journalism was to hold the powerful to account. Then you become a war correspondent and talk about what the state tells you to talk about, like how brave our troops are as they hunt our enemies, rather than how terrified the locals are. You want to learn how the brain works? Great. Study psychology. Add in a little nationalism and you can help the CIA torture more effectively. If you know enough psych, you might know a way to block out the screams from your memory. Or become a doctor. That's good for everyone, right? Well, what if you have doctor plus nationalism? Then you get doctors who experiment on patients without their knowledge. Doctors who drug and sterilize people against their will. 
hey, if my country calls upon me to do things to its enemies, or do things to its soldiers so that it can do things to its enemies, I must be doing good. It's all part of our glorious future. Not health. Did you know a number of Israeli doctors signed an open letter calling on the IDF to bomb hospitals because, quote, terrorist organizations are using hospitals as their headquarters? The letter also said Cuban forces had just shot down a U.S. fighter jet, Iraqi soldiers were pulling babies out of incubators and leaving them to die, and the North Vietnamese had just sunk our battleship by hitting square B-5 of the Gulf of Tonkin. Enemies provide a target for popular discontent, a third party the people with all the power can use to distract from who's really causing all the problems. The propaganda uses enemies to channel our emotions, from our anger and contempt to the pride we're supposed to feel when we beat our rival, even at things that don't matter like sports and beauty contests. Enemies provide historical narratives that unify the country in illusions, like how we beat those guys in that battle and that's why we're a country now, or how we suffered a humiliating defeat but one day that land will be returned to us. The enemy is a reflection of us we can use to craft an identity. We're not cruel like them, but kind. We're not confused like them, but enlightened. We appreciate beauty and honor and good stuff. They're dishonorable people who kick dogs and eat babies. But you can question what you're told. You can judge with every message about someone in an outgroup what the motivation is, how it's framed to make you think. How the message appeals to your prejudices and feeds into a stereotype. You can trace the intentions of the message back historically. When did prejudice against these people begin, and why? Corporate media have always been a crucial part of spreading nationalism and other values that keep us divided. They create and feed stereotypes of each race, culture, and part of the world we ever hear about. And we carry those stereotypes around until we unlearn them, whether we're aware of it or not. Just assuming the validity of countries as categories of people leads us to think in stereotypes. We have preconceived notions about whole countries or parts of the world as if everyone could fit into Hollywood's depiction of them. Are there any countries where everyone's the same? Or the culture doesn't change? So why do we talk like there are? We tend to learn about people and places from other people who don't know about them either, or from he newspaper headlines designed to make a certain impression. Instead of being humble and assuming we don't actually know, we take whatever imperfect image we formed, assume it as fact, and let it guide our decisions. People let stereotypes decide things like where they want to travel or live, what kind of jobs they get, and what kind of people they're willing to let immigrate. The immigration system reflects the images we've inherited from generations of being told what to think about those people over there. If you're from within these lines and have a passport, it's pretty easy to move around the world. And if not, it's not. That's because five centuries of white supremacy has made us think people from outside those lines, well, they're just not good enough to move here. Unless, of course, they have a lot of money. Thanks to the literal and figurative walls of the world, the immigrant is another outgroup. And the great thing about outgroups is anything going wrong inside the country can be blamed on them. Boss gave your job to an immigrant? Must be the immigrant's fault. Landlords are raising rents? No, immigrants are. Don't blame the people and systems who are literally doing the things we're blaming on immigrants. Who told you everything was the fault of immigrants? Could it be the people who own your home, your job, and your whole country? We don't just stereotype others, we stereotype ourselves. Instead of recognizing the complexities of any mass society, we wrap everything up in words like land of the free and home of, uh... Home of the whopper? Even people who might be humble as individuals might engage in collective narcissism. Collective narcissism has similar effects to individual narcissism, thinking you're special and overestimating your own abilities, being more likely to bully and less likely to help, lashing out at critics. 
We teach our kids to look down on people and thereby feel superior to them because the words we use for the in-group sound nicer than the words we use for the out-group. We don't care about outsiders and even root for their destruction, so we don't bother learning anything about them unless we're part of the effort to destroy them. A lot of people say they go by a philosophy of treating people as individuals with no regard to their collective identities like race, gender, and nationality. The problem is, the same brain telling them that also holds a bunch of assumptions and images that give them reasons to separate people into groups and prejudge them. We want to treat everyone the same, but when we meet someone, our initial impression might already have been made for us. We might already think a certain way about this whole group and be unaware of it. No one's free from bias, but it's especially strong when we're unaware of it or unwilling to acknowledge it. Until we really interrogate our own thinking, our minds are still under the influence of whoever told us how to think. Propaganda makes us form these hierarchies of race and nation in our minds. It teaches us to love oppressive institutions and abstract notions as if they were people and regard people as abstract notions we don't want to hear about. We stop caring about freedom and value conformity for its own sake. As nationalism has displaced religion, spreading strict monotheist values like conformity of thought and punishment of heresy passed to the nation-state. Now the heretic is the one who doesn't respect property laws or doesn't have a job. Nationalism teaches us not to care about most people. Enemies determine government budgets. Military, police, prisons, and borders are all justified as necessary due to the presence of enemies. Your enemies are anyone who breaks the law, anyone the police target, anyone the courts convict, and anyone the state says is a terrorist. The external or foreign enemy justifies war and even conscription, empires and colonization, espionage, propaganda and often censorship, militarizing borders and waving flags. The internal enemy or fifth column or any of the types of criminal we're supposed to be terrified of justifies everything police and prisons do. Witch hunts. You know, actually getting cancelled for unorthodox opinions. Fear of your neighbors and trust in so-called strong leaders and censorship. As a result of having these enemies, people are more loyal to the state than to each other. They suspect each other of things and report each other to authority. People who believe in these enemies tend not to complain about endlessly rising budgets for violence, even when it means taking money away from poor people. Because the purpose of the state is to do violence, not to help the poor, and the propaganda reflects this setup. Obviously the real problem is people on welfare. Community and solidarity become impossible and we remain dependent on the states that rule us and the corporations that own everything. It might not feel like we're being ruled though. There's great propaganda value in blurring the lines between people and the institutions that rule them. States want powerless people to believe they are the state, that there are no classes because the state represents everyone. What's more, whether it's a teacher punishing a class or the IDF punishing Gaza, the task is made easier by treating everyone as a one guilty mass. A few years of war propaganda about how all the people in that society are bad and you might approve of dropping a nuclear weapon on them. Russia invades Ukraine and says it's because there are Nazis there, and, you know, they could be anywhere, so obviously invade and occupy all of Ukraine. At the same time, people started harassing and boycotting Russian people with no connection to power. They proposed punishing all Russians for the actions of the state. But why? They're not the same. The state doesn't represent people with no connection to power. In Russia, it represents rich Russians who aren't in prison, and Russian nationalists who let the state do their thinking for them. For another example, Fox News pundits are now using the fact that the voters of the time gave Hamas 3% more votes than Fatah 
17 years ago as proof that Palestinians are basically all Hamas and all viable targets. But if you think that makes them all complicit in war crimes their government commits, then boy, do I have bad news for you about decades of US foreign policy. <laughs> It's so obviously fallacious, but I hear it every day. The state did something, so the people are guilty. The people voted, therefore they agree with and are responsible for everything the state does. Now everyone is expected to unequivocally denounce Hamas in the strongest terms before they can say Palestinians should be allowed to live. At some of the protests of Israel's current bombing campaign, some people take the opportunity to get anti-Semitic instead of just criticizing Israel, when individual Jews and the state of Israel are obviously not the same thing. Zionists use this opportunity to distract from what Israel's doing, saying it's only defending itself against anti-Semitism. The IDF bombs hospitals and ambulances in the Gaza Strip, and people say it's good because some Palestinians are terrorists, so it's okay to bomb all Palestinians indiscriminately. That's how it becomes so easy to laugh at their deaths. When you have an enemy, you don't want to know their reasons, because that would humanize them and put them on your level. You want them to be irrationally committed to your destruction, incapable of coexisting with you. Then they can all be your enemy, and you can celebrate when they die. To end this video, I will repeat what I said at the beginning. I'm not arguing against having enemies. I consider all oppressive systems and ideologies my enemy, and I won't be satisfied until they're destroyed. Systems designed to concentrate power cannot be turned into systems for advancing freedom, justice, peace, or equality. They are why we are so hopelessly indoctrinated and so violently divided. Are we capable of overcoming the physical and mental barriers keeping us apart? We'll see.